purple asters burst and fade among a galaxy of orange cosmos, signaling the final days of summer like a flare in the evening sky. The wind carries a crisp apple chill in its arms, delivering to the first fallen leaf of the season, barely yellowed from the frost. Let's turn a page in the last season and fall into something promising, something new, no matter how daunting that may be. Welcome to Games in the Glade, a stress-free gaming news and reviews podcast. I'm your host, Tina Kelly, and I'll be guiding you through some recent news in the gaming world, as well as telling you about a game I think that you will enjoy. Today, I'll be discussing the demo for Thirsty Suitors, some new games that are coming to subscription services in October, the Kirby 30th Anniversary Music Fest, and the GDQ Flame Fatales event. I'll also discuss a new Souls-like RPG game, talk about some game devs who are getting into podcasting, discuss the new Crypt of the Necrodancer DLC, and its spin-off game. I'll get to your responses to last episode's question about your current comfort games, and talk a little bit about a comfy game called Freshly Frosted. And finally, I'll give my review of Card Shark and finish up by asking you about what game's art style has impressed you the most. If you're looking to play something and want a sample of what's to come, there's a demo out now for Thirsty Suitors on Steam. It's about culture, relationships, family pressures, and self-expression. The main character, Jala, needs to confront her exes in turn-based battles, making use of special abilities and a special mood system in order to take advantage of her opponent's vulnerabilities, not to destroy them, but to reconcile with them. One of her first opponents is Sergio, who has had a crush on Jala ever since grade school, but has had difficulty coming to terms with the fact that Jala just isn't the gal for him. So the two hash things out in battle, not with their fists, but with their words. I actually appreciated the fact that these two got resolution that not only helped them understand each other, but themselves better. So check out Thirsty Suitors on Steam. The full game is coming soon, but the demo is a nice way to see if it's the kind of game for you. Plus, there's skateboarding in the game? I think it's the main method of transportation. That's kind of cool. I'll link the demo in the description of this episode. I've rewritten this section at least three times now as time has slipped through my fingers, but no longer. I am happy to tell you this month's games available for PlayStation Plus monthly members, so make the most of your monthly subscriptions by checking them out. First up for raising fans, Hot Wheels Unleashed for the PS4 and PS5 lets you play with your favorite toys without making a big mess of the living room floor. You can build and race cars in a two-player split-screen format for couch co-op, or you can play online against 12 other people. Sounds like fun. Injustice 2 is also available this month, so if you're a big DC Comics fan, you can play as some of your favorite heroes and villains. Injustice is made by the same folks who made Mortal Kombat, so it's got that fighting game pedigree. It has a story mode to play through, as well as online matchmaking, so get out there and have a blast. And finally, Super Hot is joining the PlayStation catalog. This first-person shooter has a very interesting time-based shooting mechanic where... Time only moves when you move, so it's a bit of a puzzler as well as a high-octane thriller. Thanks to Vic Hood for the information from their article, PlayStation Plus Free Games October 2022, over on Tech Radar. I'll link that in the description this episode. Next up, what's new and coming soon to Xbox Game Pass. Chivalry 2, the multiplayer medieval first-person slasher, is available now. If you want to hop online, bust out your bow and arrow, and lay siege to a castle with a bunch of friends, get to it. And if you're in the medieval mood still, Medieval Dynasty is also out for the Xbox series X and S. In it, you play as a young war refugee who leads his community to safety and prosperity. If you're in the Halloween-y mood, you can't go wrong with Costume Quest, available October 11th. It's starring a bunch of kids trying to save Halloween from evil monsters in their neighborhood. There's also The Walking Dead Seasons 1 and 2, starring Lee Everett and Clementine, survivors of the dystopian, zombie-filled world who band together to survive. These telltale games put you, the player, in charge of their fate, so every choice matters. A new game coming to Game Pass is Evil. I hope that's how you pronounce it. It's got two L's in it, just evil with two L's and an E at the end. It's a multiplayer social deduction game, kind of like Werewolf, if you've ever played that before, or Among Us, which I'm pretty sure most people have heard about by now. You need to convince others, perhaps rightfully or perhaps wrongfully, that you're not behind the murders that are plaguing the town. 
And if you're a fan of factory building, the Dyson Sphere program coming October 13th might be your jam. In this space simulation strategy game, you use star power, collect resources, and build a factory from the ground up to create an industry the likes of which the galaxy has never seen. A spooky offering coming soon is Scorn, a first-person horror adventure game that is designed around the idea of being thrown into a world, not knowing much about it. This one looks like it's inspired partly by H.R. Geiger, so fans of his art might want to check this one out. Finally, A Plague Tale Requiem will be available day one with Game Pass, launching October 18th. A sister and brother duo struggle to survive in a world overrun with the plague with a magical mystical twist. Thanks to Megan Spur at the Xbox Game Pass blog for the information on the games coming to Game Pass. That article is in the description below, of course. Do you need a bit of a boost right now? Need something to cheer you up? Maybe some music to help you tidy up around the house? Might I recommend the Kirby Music Fest? Earlier in August, a big band of talented musicians took to the stage to bring Kirby's music to life, covering iconic tracks from the series in a live performance broadcast on YouTube. The stunning performance in honor of Kirby's 30th anniversary lasted about two hours with a few informative intermissions sprinkled in and featured a surprise appearance by Kirby's voice actor, Makiko Omoto, who graced the world with an angelic duet with singer Nachel as they belted out Welcome to the New World from Kirby and the Forgotten Land together. I don't know why, but Kirby stuff always makes me cry, and this was no exception. Hearing Omoto sing and then exit with a charming Poyo was... Enough to bring me to tears, I guess. That's how this month is going. So if you want to experience the cuteness yourself, I'll link the performance in the description of this episode. Please note, the performance starts about an hour and 30 minutes into the video, but the lead up to that is pre-recorded music, which is also very good. How about some good news on the charity front? Games Done Quick's Flame Fatales, a woman-led charity event, raised over $135,000 for the Malala Fund, which strives to give every girl the right to 12 years of safe, free, and quality education. The event spanned from August 21st to 27th and featured dozens of runners banding together to raise money for a great cause. Like all GDQ events, it would be impossible for me to summarize every run featured, so here's a rundown of a few of my favorites. First up, Metroid Crime ran Metroid Dread. This was the first run that I caught, and Metroid Crime's good humor regarding all the crime rhymes that were sent her way by clever donators endeared me to her and invested me in the run. Dread is a very fun speedrun to watch, and Metroid Crime does a great job explaining the skips, the pitfalls, and the history of the Metroid Dread run. The next run that I caught was Amber underscore CXC's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Bonus Tracks and DLC Waves 1 and 2 run. Amber's speed and precision were impressive, as were her horns. She has these giant goat-like horns. Really incredible. I've never seen a Mario Kart speedrun before, but I stuck around for Amber's humor and skill. The fact that she got saddled with racing as Waluigi and still raced extremely well was fantastic. And her couch was excellent as well, forming an informative chorus that had me cracking up. It's a great one to watch. Another must-watch run for me was Clipper running Mega Man 10, 100%. Clipper had a great rapport with her co-commentator Will Shadow. It was great to hear them talk about playing Mega Man back in the day, reading Nintendo Power for hints, and sharing their knowledge of the game. Okay, two more runs. There is a bajillion runs for the Flame Fatales event, but I just want to highlight just two more. I loved watching Claire Lind run Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time because Zelda runs are classic. You can't really go wrong with an Ocarina of Time run. You just want to unplug your brain and watch things go fast. And Claire's run of Ocarina of Time was the right mix of entertaining, informative, and very nostalgic. Katie Noel also provided excellent commentary on the couch. It's a good long run to put on if you want something comfy to watch or listen to while you work. Last but not least, the final run that I watched was actually one of the first runs to start off the program. Black Heart Wings ran Stardew Valley Crafts Room Percent, and it had me enraptured. Stardew Valley speedruns are interesting to me because they condense a sprawling experience into a bite-sized run that'll blow you away. 
Blackheart Wing's seated crafts room run does just that, with the runner explaining how and why she manipulates the game's RNG in order to fill out the demands of Stardew Valley's woodland spirits, the Junimos, by foraging and collecting the items she needs across four seasons. In this seated run, certain things are RNG manipulated, like what offerings the traveling cartwoman will have on any given day, or what items will spawn in certain tiles on the ground when you hoe up the dirt. With her knowledge of the game and her expert execution, Blackheart Wings fixed up the community center's crafts room in 25 minutes. It was touching to hear Blackheart Wings talk about her personal connection to the Malala Fund because her family is Pakistani. And of course, Malala Yousafzai is a Pakistani activist and the titular founder of the Malala Fund. If you want a short and sweet run to watch, this run is the one for you. I'll be linking all these runs and the Twitch channels for each runner in the description of this episode. And if you have a favorite run that I missed, please let me know. I would love to see it. RPG writer Grant Howitt, the mind behind tabletop role-playing game Honey Heist, has brewed up another fun role-playing escapade. Effed Up Little Man, a Dark Souls fan RPG. We're just a little guy who needs to unheck the world. Of course, the title has some swears in it. The effed up little man is a different word you can fill out and try not to cuss on this podcast. Best played in a group, each player takes turns being the damned one, who is some kind of knight-looking dude in search of a chalice of embers. You traverse a map designed collaboratively by all the players, which includes from soft staples like swamps, towers, ruins, crappy little villages made of boards and garbage, cemeteries, and jails. You wander through passages and pits and face off against beasts, traps, undeads, and presumably, but not explicitly mentioned, the worst from soft enemy of all, dogs. The damned one attempts to traverse these obstacles and must roll for success with a six-sided die determining their fate. If you roll poorly, you'll perform so badly that you instantly die. If you roll better, you might succeed but still sustain damage. If you roll well, you succeed with aplomb. Once you sustain four damage total, the damned one dies and returns to the starting area, and the player to their right must take control of the damned one. Additionally, an echo spawns where the damned one last died, and that echo can be used to help the current living damned one to surpass the obstacle that killed their predecessor uh, before by granting them an additional d6 to roll with advantage. How does this RPG get its name, of course? Well, all players who aren't currently the damned one play as effed up little men, the characteristic Dark Souls NPCs that either help or hinder the player on their quest. They might be a gruff but well-intentioned merchant, or maybe a doctor who regrets their past, or even a conniving jerk who will kick you off of a platform and you turn your back. Patches. Every effed up little man has their own unique refrain that they utter after their lines, like most Dark Souls NPCs who concerningly end their sentences with a haunting laugh. And the effed up little men reside in whatever area it was of the map that that player drew up at the beginning of the game. When the damned one seeks them out in their map section, they can offer supplies, advice, support, or they can just be weird. The game requires that the effed up little men, one, never give a straight answer, Two, retroactively justify previous malarkey that was covered in the game. And three, utter their refrain often. With the help of the effed up little men, the damned one will reach the final boss, which will always be located in the final area of the map, which will then be defined by the group upon discovery. Maybe the final boss is a big knight with two swords. Or maybe it's a weird tentacle beast that eats regions. Or maybe it's a big stinky sick rat. Whatever the group comes up with, the Damned One fights it until the Damned One wins and secures the Chalice of Embers, thus bringing light to the land and possibly ending the Endless Blight. Or if it's a Souls game, the sixth cycle continues but in a different way? Or you become a squid. However you want your campaign to end, that is up to you. This looks like a totally fun game to play with some folks someday. I'll link Grant Howitt's Patreon post where you can find a PDF of the game's guidelines with helpful illustrations as well as a text-only version of the rules.
In a spot of news I found very interesting, two titans of game development, Hideo Kojima and Masahiro Sakurai, have both begun separate projects this year to let fans get a glimpse inside their creative process. Hideo Kojima has created a Spotify original podcast called Brain Structure, a talk show style discussion of his favorite topics like games, movies, art, music, and society, collaborating with guests from around the world. Jeff Keighley, who you might have seen hosting the Game Awards and Summer Game Fest, will be a recurring guest to spotlight updates in tech and gaming. The podcast launched on September 8th and will release episodes weekly in both English and Japanese. Thanks to the writers at For the Record on the Spotify blog for the information from their article, Hideo Kojima Presents, Brain Structure Will Unravel the Genius Mind of This Video Game Creator, which I have linked in the description. And as I mentioned, Masahiro Sakurai, the father of Kirby and the lead designer on the Smash game series, has also launched his own project, a YouTube channel where he discusses elements of game design, focusing particularly on what makes games fun. I watch a few of his videos with my brother, and I can't tell you how delightful it is to watch Sakurai in front of the camera again, discussing things that he's passionate about. If you've ever turned into a Smash Direct from Nintendo, you might remember Sakurai discussing the design, development, and movesets of various characters introduced to the Smash Brothers with good humor. That same spirit is there for his exploration of topics like tension and release and fighting enemies or traversing obstacles in a video game. The videos are short, between 2 and 10 minutes, which is very refreshing, I have to say. It's a lovely watch, even if you have no aspirations towards game design. That will also be linked in the description of this episode. Surprising news for rhythm game fans. Crypt of the Necrodancer, the rhythm-based battler dungeon crawler, is getting new DLC for the first time in five years. The new DLC, Synchrony, includes new characters like Shantur, who can possess enemies and use them to fight other enemies, Suzu, who can dash quickly and invincibly through obstacles and enemies, and Clarinetta, whose huge sword wipes out swaths of enemies. Brace Yourself Games, the developers, also announced that up to eight players could play cooperatively or in versus battles with the new DLC. Brace Yourself Games also announced a spin-off game called Rift of the Necro Dancer, which from the trailer looks like it mixes together a little bit of punch out, a little bit of rhythm heaven, and a little bit of guitar hero. I'll link the trailers for the DLC and the new game in the description of this episode so you can see them for yourself, but I think all this new content is going to be a big hit. Thank you to Kate Gray for the article, Crypt of the Necrodancer Comes Back from the Dead with Co-op, New Characters, and a Sequel over at Nintendo Life. I'll link to Kate's article in the description of this episode. Last episode, I asked you all what games are bringing you comfort lately. Here are your responses. Deep Fried Water on Twitter responded, Recently, Persona 3 and the Mega Man Battle Network Chip Challenge. The latter is an odd spin-off of Mega Man Battle Network series that turned into a 1v1 auto-battler that was heavily based on RNG. It's a poorly received entry according to Deep Fried Water, but a childhood favorite of theirs to revisit. You know Deep Fried Water. I've heard that the Persona series is a comfort series for a lot of folks. One of the podcasters I listen to, Griffin McElroy, says that he replays Persona 4 every so often because he loves the cozy feel of that game and its intrigue as well. And my brother actually loved the Mega Man Battle Network games, Deep Fried Water. I haven't heard of the Chip Challenge spinoff, but an auto battler does sound very chill. Alex underscore Kid KR said that his comfort game recently has been Final Fantasy XIV. Sometime within the last month, as of the time of me... Asking the question, Final Fantasy became that game for me. Planning outfits, learning new classes, doing some of the major stuff that he hasn't done yet, and emote hunting provide some easy and comforting tasks when he's feeling low on brain energy but still wants to do something. I have also been playing Final Fantasy XIV on Saturdays with my community on Twitch. My favorite part so far truly has been seeing the amazing outfits that people come up with in the game. So I'm glad to hear that outfit planning has been fun. Otherwise, I would feel a little guilty about staging a weekly fashion show. And the emote hunting actually sounds like a nice way to get a good fix of that I accomplished something feeling without having to go through a long, drawn-out quest that has world-shattering consequences. So I think Final Fantasy XIV is a great game to play for comfy times, Alex. 
Corios on Discord said that Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes is his comfy game. He says, I'd say my comfy game as of late would be Fire Emblem Warriors. Not only is this the first time I've picked up my Switch in the good part of a year, which is worth celebrating on its own, but the new game design and infamous character arc specifically have me reaching for the controller before bed every night to get a good few missions and supports in. Unlike the previous Fire Emblem titles, Corey now sees a purpose in grinding old missions now, which means he gets to spend more time cozying up and playing his game. Corios also added, Thanks for your content, GITG. Love from Canada. Thank you for the love, Corey. You are great. Uh, I'm with you on Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes being perfect for comfort these days. I feel like its story is like a big blanket. I can wrap myself up in it, and the characters at this point feel like old friends. But I am probably over a thousand hours into the world of Fodland, so that might just be me. And being able to grind missions means more time bonking enemies over the head, which is nice when you just want to unplug your brain. Quantum in Discord said, Lately I've been no comfy, only MMO grind. But Quantum used to play Souls games as his comfy games, especially Dark Souls 3. Maybe Elden Ring will take that place one of these days. And Quantum said, parenthetically, I was hoping Three Hopes would become that game for me like it has for you, but unfortunately, as I feared, the core gameplay has grown a little boring for Quantum. No worries if Fire Emblem Three Hopes is not clicking Quantum. It's all about what feels good, and I'm glad that the Souls games bring you a sense of comfort. I know a lot of people see them as being too difficult to enjoy, which is very valid, but folks like Quantum and I get joy out of a familiar battle against a big bad baddie. And the worlds are so beautiful and so thoughtfully put together, and stepping back into them kind of feels like coming home. Like when you're returning to Majula and you sit out by the sun-soaked bonfire, or when you waltz through Inner Londo and you're surrounded on all sides by rich architecture. And for me, returning to Bloodborne is an autumnal comfort. There's something very weirdly cozy about the streets of Yarnum, filled as they might be with monsters. So thank you, Quantum. You and in Discord said, Final Fantasy XIV is that comfy game. Knowing I can log on regardless of how much or how little time that I have, there's always something for me to do. From visiting the Golden Saucer and gambling to completing side quests to embarking on a main story scenario quest, the world of Aorza has comfy times galore. Thank you for that, Ewan. We have another Final Fantasy XIV fan. There's a lot of them in the community. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV has so much to offer, and there's lots of little things to do that are fun and still very rewarding. I haven't given the Golden Saucer a real try yet, but I do love that it offers casual minigames to play in case you don't want to focus on progress for the evening. Snake in Discord also offered Final Fantasy XIV as his comfy game. He said, I've really been lacking how there's so much to do, yet the game never makes you feel like you need to rush to avoid missing out on anything. On the contrary, he says, many parts of the game actually force you to do things slowly. It's great because, he says, I can just do what I want day to day, whether I'm feeling head empty or in the mood to do more gripping content. And, he says also, when I'm feeling a change of scenery, I'll hop into the equally comfy Three Hopes, which, he says, I feel needs no further explanation given who I'm talking to here. Oh, lol. I am a renowned Fire Emblem fan. The openness of Final Fantasy XIV might seem overwhelming at first, as it does to a lot of people who don't play MMOs, like me. But I agree with Snake. You're never really rushed to forge ahead, and you can try different classes and subclasses to see whatever fits you. Some games might lock you into a certain path, but I like that Final Fantasy XIV lets you explore your options at your pace. As for me, as these responses might suggest, I've been playing even more Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes for comfort, because the combat features some regular combos that I can button mash, and the levels are fairly short at under 10 minutes. But I've also dipped into Freshly Frosted thanks to the developer Quantum Astrophysics Guild for giving me a key for it. I booted it up the other day when I was feeling really tired but also very anxious, and scrolling through Twitter was only making me feel worse. And that brings me to my micro-review of Freshly Frosted. Freshly Frosted has a simple premise. You're operating an imaginary donut factory that's floating in the sky. You need to place conveyor belts in your factory to convey the donuts from one side of the 
factory to the other, depending on what order you need to complete. You also may need to route those belts through frosting, sprinkles, whipped cream, or cherry stations to place the appropriate toppings on the donuts before they get to the end station. I was able to play through the first four scenarios. Spring, summer, fall, and winter, all narrated by a dreamy, pleasant person who is imagining these donuts with you. The puzzles start off very easy and they gain complexity as you go through your scenarios. Freshly Frosted reminds me a little bit of Baba Is You, but it's less of a head scratcher in a good way. Sometimes you want a very challenging puzzle, and other times you want something that's a little easier to visualize. For instance, I bought Baba Is You for a six hour flight back home from a convention three or four years ago, but I don't think I passed the first scenario of it. I beat the first few puzzles and then I got stuck, which is great. It made a six hour flight feel much shorter because I was so focused on each level and then beating those levels was a huge triumph. But for unwinding at night, if I'm trying to relax, I need something that's a little more straightforward and easy to visualize, and Freshly Frosted fits that nicely. Plus, each puzzle has a built-in hint system that starts you off with a few optimally placed conveyor belts. Then you can fill in the blanks to get to the end. I ended up using the hint system on most levels because I was feeling kind of tender and stressed out, and I just wanted to breeze through things. And still, with that hint system, I was able to have a good time figuring out the solutions to each puzzle. So, if you're looking for a comfy game, I would recommend Freshly Frosted. It helped chase some of my anxiety away. On to the big review. A little while back, I played Card Shark, developed by Nariel and published by Devolver Digital on June 2nd of this year on stream. I had seen a trailer for the game about a year or so ago, and what instantly grabbed me was the art style, which is kind of cartoonish and definitely hand-drawn, resembling art piece or a satirical comic from magazines of old. From there, I was hooked. It's a game about cheating at poker, not at playing poker per se so if you have no knowledge of how poker works you'll still be able to play and enjoy the game they do have a good tutorial for suits and cards and values and all that jazz if you don't know i've never seen a game focus exclusively on the cheating aspect of card playing which is a skill set in and of itself so card shark is an interesting glimpse into a different world Card Shark is set in Enlightenment era France, immediately preceding the French Revolution, and stars a cast from that time period, as well as a few from a little before and a little after, and also from all around the world, to contribute to a colorful and interesting cast. The story follows a nameless protagonist who stumbles across the name Eugene somewhere along the way, and his whirlwind adventures in French politics and court drama. One faithful day, the Comte de Saint-Germain, a philosopher, alchemist, and all-around lovable scoundrel, uh, comes to the inn that Eugene is working at and offers to mentor him in poker. Things go well, as Eugene is a bright young man, until, of course, they don't, and an angry general rightfully tries to shoot the Comte for cheating at poker. He misses, thankfully, but instead kills the surly innkeeper that had employed Eugene, and so the two of them stay on the run in France trying to make enough coin to support themselves and the camp of Romani people who shelter them along the way. As you journey throughout France, you're taught new card tricks at every stop, and each one builds upon the next. I was able to beat the game in about three or four sessions, with about a week in between, so initially I was worried about forgetting important card tricks like in-jogging, which is when you deliberately set a good card in the middle of your deck while shuffling, then you layer a marker card on top of it, which pokes out slightly, and then you shuffle the rest of the cards below that without risking losing the card you want. It sounds very complex, but you do it so many times that it becomes second nature. And if, or really when, I forgot how to do a trick, I could always go back and practice it. This came in handy when I would put the game down for a little bit. Most tricks build upon another trick you've learned, like up jogging, which is a variant of in jogging, or a trick where you signal the number of a certain strong suit in an opponent's hand, rather than only signaling the card with the highest value. As the card tricks become more intense, so does the plot, as you go from scamming drunkards and amiable rich folk to dangerous men who want you dead. 
I don't want to give away too much of the plot because it truly is marvelous, so I'll stop short of revealing any major details. Eugene and the Comte are trying to discover the truth of a scandal in the French court regarding King Louis XIV. There are rumors that the king had married in secret and that his love met a tragic end, but it's up to the Comte and Eugene to discover who this mystery woman was and the circumstances around her death. That comprises the 12 bottles of milk scandal. I will say this, she did not perish from drinking 12 bottles of milk in a row. It's far more interesting than that. The more you learn about the scandal, the wilder and more ungraspable it becomes. Just when I thought I had understood what the game was giving me, the game then spun me in a different direction. I just had to keep coming back for more. I felt like each victorious card battle pushed me further into a storm. Every success drove me closer to the truth. Even if you don't know much about cards or even the French Revolution, I think you'll get caught up in this incredible journey. The artwork of Card Shark was the thing that drew me to the game at first, and I was blown away when I learned that there were over 2,000 individual sprites used in the game to comprise the paper doll aesthetic of each character, even the background ones. I listened to an interview between the lead artist Nikolai Trashinsky and the folks at Sifter, which is an independent Australian video games publication. I'll link that article in the description of this episode. In the interview, Trashinsky discusses the process of hand printing and painting all of the characters and all of the background assets for Card Shark, and his dedication to the craft is truly amazing. For the game, Trashinsky used the technique of mono printing, which is spreading paint on a surface and then stamping it. This allows for unique textures, but it limits your ability to create fine details. While individual monoprinted blobs may not look like a lot, when they are combined to form a scene, you can pull together forests of blobs, a city of loose shapes, or even a royal chamber of glistening gold, all through the suggestion of form and the grain and the strokes of the paint. He individually inked each of these pieces of each character, creating 2,000 pieces of arms, legs, faces, feet, shoes, hands, and everything else on the body to combine to form a moving character. The way this is achieved is a little bit of trickery in itself, with the pieces floating in 2D space, not attached to each other or skinned over a model that's rigged, but moving in concert near each other floating over each other piece, seeming to move three-dimensionally by overlapping in different ways. And there are tons of these characters in each scene, set against the hazy suggestion of a bar, a royal garden, or an island, bringing life and specificity to the world. I loved watching the background characters move and sway in each scene. They truly felt alive, like real patrons of a bar, as they gesticulated to each other, fanned themselves, drank and swore, and of course, played cards with one another. Another aspect of this game that makes it so iconic, brought it to life, and set it apart from any other card game you'll ever play, is the music produced by Andrea Bocadoro. It perfectly immerses you in the time period in which Card Shark is set. It builds tension, and best of all, it feels very fancy. I would give the soundtrack a listen anytime you want to feel smart and a little diabolical, which I think we all do from time to time. Many of the tracks are arrangements of classical pieces from Mozart to Beethoven to anonymous compositions from French and Latin sources. One of my favorite variations by Bocadoro is the track that plays during your impressive display of cheating against the French writer and philosopher Voltaire, who delights in your game as an interesting diversion. The Papagino composition captures that intellectual whimsy and the gentlemanly nature of your competition. I really admire Bocadora's original compositions for being able to still feel contemporary to the arrangements and variations of the past, while still having a distinct flavor of their own. Take the carriage theme, for example. It's one you'll hear very often as it plays when the Comte briefs you on your next opponent as you travel by carriage to your destination. You learn and practice a new trick, and then you work on your writing for a little bit as the Comte is dedicated to your education. There's a deliberation to the track, as well as a kind of conspiratorial nature, which is the perfect backdrop to your lessons.
And there are some tracks that really set the mood for new elements being introduced to the game, like the element of danger. Aside from the initial colonel confrontation and him shooting Mrs. Porterhouse, the innkeep, in the beginning, your first real taste of danger and brush with death in Card Shark is the ambush at the manor house, when the Comte and Eugene are waiting Baroness de Beauregard, searching for more details on the 12 bottles of milk scandal. They're confronted by hired guns, and the attempt to distract these gentlemen, of course, was a game of cards. This was the first instance where I actually lost and died, making very real our enemies' threats of violence. The ambush track that plays while you play against these foes captures this essence of danger that they pose, as well as having an undercurrent of your own methodical conniving. And let's say that you fail, as I did. Well, you don't get a cute little Mario-esque death song and reset to back where you were before you played whatever bad hand it was that cost you the fight. No. Instead, you have to face death and either pay from your funds to buy back your life, or better yet, cheat death itself at cards. I don't think I need to tell you what the more entertaining option is. When you encounter death, a suitably frightening theme plays, underscoring the very real threat of the end that awaits you if you fail. I do want to point out one very clever detail of death's track, which is titled Limbo, and that that there is a kind of galloping clacking in the background that's very rhythmic. It's like, da dunk, da dunk, da dunk. Interestingly, and maybe not coincidentally, when you're revived from death, you don't begin back at your seat, ready to replay your hand. You're not rewinding time to the moment before you lost. Instead, you wake up in the carriage with the comte across from you, asking you if you're all right because you've just had one of your seizures. So maybe the clacking that we hear in this track is the wheels of the carriage that's running over uneven roads as Eugene teeters on the brink of worlds about to return to the land of the living. Maybe. It's just a guess. From the music to the art and back to the amazing story, Card Shark was a spectacular game that I would recommend to anyone who likes France, history, intrigue, cheating, political scandals, Cross-dressing. I forgot to mention the cross-dressing. It is cross-dressing. It's great. And of course, poker. Because Card Shark's art style blew me away, I want to ask you this episode. What games do you think are the most visually stunning? What art styles have impressed you the most in a video game? If you'd like to respond, you have a few options. You can respond to the tweet that I'm going to put out, or you can tweet directly at Games in the Glade on Twitter using the G-I-T-G asks hashtag. Or if you're listening to this on YouTube, you can leave a comment below the video. That's all I have for you today. There will be more news and reviews every other week, so keep an eye out for updates on your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube, and follow the show's Twitter account at Games in the Glade for more. This podcast is supported by Friends of the Forest on Patreon, a link for which I will leave in the description. Thanks to Puddles of Infinity for the use of their song, Porches and Universes, and thank you to Titsay for the beautiful album art. And even though our time together is coming to an end, you can always find your way back here, my world-worn weary friend. There's a spot here in the clearing, in the quietude and shade, for you to relax a while and listen to Games in the Glade.